So let me ask you a question. What would you say is the most troubling sin or passion that we face today in the postmodern world? Would it be pride? Maybe lust? Maybe envy? Gluttony? What, what would you consider? Have you ever considered that it might be Axity? What, what's Axity? I don't even think I've ever heard of Axity. What's Axity? What? <laughs> That's exactly what Axity is. <laughs> and I'll explain why. <laughs> Thank you. The reader, Stephen, has friends right It comes from the Greek word, Akadia, which is usually translated as despondency or hopelessness. You don't normally think of uh, hopelessness as one of the deadly passions. It's not in the list of the seven deadly sins, right? But it is actually in the earliest kind of lists of deadly passions that we face uh, and is considered by many of the fathers to be one of the most troublesome and dangerous, especially uh, as they were writing uh, two and four months. Uh, that was a particular problem for them. And in our day and age, academia or axity is a major driver behind our sinful behaviors, hopelessness. So today we're going to look at hope and hopelessness, the relationship between hope and what it means to be a good caretaker and caregiver of God's gifts and of our relationships, of ourselves and those around us. And we... This comes to mind to us especially because we are presented this weekend with three incredible examples of good stewardship of hope, of the good keeping and caregiving of hope. The first are two people, Saints Simeon and Anna, who met the Lord in the temple on the 40th day after his birth. They were both of a great age. Saint Simeon was probably over a hundred years old when he encountered the Christ. One tradition has him even in the range of over uh, a couple hundred years old, but suffice it to say he was very old. And Anna, the prophetess, we hear that she was uh, at least 84 years old if you read it one way. If she was a widow for 84 years, that means she was probably um, in her, in about a hundred years old as well. So they're both kind of the, 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 the eldest of the people of God at that time. And they are in the temple praying every day and waiting for the promise of the Messiah to come to them. That is an incredible stewardship of hope. That's an incredible keeping and nurturing of a hope and waiting for it patiently until it is fulfilled for them. Not even in its completeness, but really quite literally in its infancy. And then it's enough. St. Simeon says, Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace. It's good enough for me. I've seen your salvation, even though he's only seen the Christ trial. The second image we have today for us is this, this kind of shocking gospel of the Canaanite woman, who in spite of incredible difficulty and, the, and, the, and really the rejection of her by the Messiah, pursues in hope the healing of her daughter. And so the Lord says, Woman, great is your faith. May your daughter be healed. So this is an incredible pair of examples of people who understood the power of hope and safeguard it. Hope is considered one of the greatest, three greatest virtues according to St. Paul. Remember from 1 Corinthians, and now these three abide, faith, hope, and love. And St. Paul says the greatest of these is love, but actually, in many respects, love depends on hope. As you see elsewhere, right, faith is what? The substance of things hoped for. So faith depends on hope. The second is, when he talks about taking up your, the armor, he talks about the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of salvation. So the helmet quite literally sits above the other two. And if you think about it, if you put, if you're a soldier 
especially in the, in the ancient days, but even today in our military, if you go out into the field of battle and you have your armor on but you have no helmet, you're, in, you're at great risk. In fact, not wearing your helmet could be considered one of the most careless things you could do in, in times of battle. And spiritually, if you don't protect your hope and you don't have the hope of salvation in you, what good is that faith and that love that you might carry? Because you can easily be knocked down by despair at any time when you see the hardships of the world, the evils of the world, and you see your own life get difficult. So carelessness is actually right there at the heart of what akadia means. Kedia is to give care. And we see the use of it um, not too often in the, in the Bible, but you do see that, that, that term being used in the book of Maccabees when they talk about taking care of the dead. In this case, it was actually taking care of uh, dead soldiers in particular. Taking care of those who have passed. When Joseph of Arimathea and the bird-bearing women came to the cross to take him down and then came again on the third day, they were showing Kedia, the care and love for someone. So akadia, where you see that A in front of a word in Greek, is usually a negative, like atheist, right? Not believing in God. Akadia is not caring. And so that's at the heart. Carelessness or not caring is all deeply related to hopelessness and despondency. I just, and that's the way we use it in English, right? Another way to say is I've given up hope is I just don't care anymore. I don't care about it. Or, Whatever. <laughs> there is a, a orthodox licensed clinical pastoral counselor and addiction specialist named David Holden, who in 2004 gave a wonderful talk at the O Camper Conference. O Camper stands for Orthodox Christian Association of Medical Professionals. They have a conference every year. If you're in that field, I encourage you to go to one of those. Uh, and he gave a presentation on the Christian ascetic tradition on dejection and despondency. And uh, he was showing how modern day discussion of depression often um, is actually less precise than what the fathers talked about. They distinguish between dejection or sadness or sorrow and despondency or hopelessness, academia. And he talks about it at length. He mentions, for example, that you see the word akadia being used in the, in the Psalter, in the Greek Psalter, the, the um, superscription or title of Psalm 102 or 101 in the Septuagint says, a prayer of one afflicted when suffering from akadia or hopelessness and pleading before the Lord. And the Psalm includes those wonderful, uh, as, as, as Bono of you 2 said, the Psalms are the blues of the Bible. And, you know, my days pass away like smoke, my bones burn like a furnace, my heart is stricken and withered like grass, I am too wasted to eat my bread. And uh, I read that, but in my head I'm, I'm singing it to some blues guitar, like B.B. King or something. So yes, depression, but not uh, any kind of depression, very precise type, if you will. It's not sadness or grief, but it's a, a, a sadness, an emptiness, grief stretched beyond its normal limits, distorting reality, he says, and withdrawing from others, isolating ourselves. He says uh, that the fathers use the term from the Psalms as well, the noonday demon, or the demon of noonday. You might have heard that in some of the Psalms. Preserve me from the demon of noonday. And the Desert Fathers understood this as Akadia because this was something they experienced particularly from about 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., the noon, noon day. In the middle of the heat of the day, uh, they would, they would su suffer and struggle with this just despondency. Evagrius of Ponticus, who's uh, one of the um, great Desert Early Fathers who talked about these deadly passions, describes it this way. He says, the demon of Akadia, also called the noonday demon, is the one that causes the most trouble of all. First of all, he makes it seem like the sun barely moves, and if at all, that the day is 50 hours long. Then he constrains the monk to look constantly out the windows, to walk outside the cell, 
to gaze carefully at the sun to determine how far it stands from the ninth hour. So basically, uh, if you are at work, it makes you get up out of your cubicle, walk around, watch the clock, try to find somebody to occupy yourself with. Uh, in the modern day, the demon of noonday has assistants. They're called uh, solitaire and minesweeper, <laughs> or whatever other forms they might take, right? He instills in the heart of the monk a hatred for the place, a hatred for his very life itself, a hatred for manual labor. He leads him to reflect that charity has departed from among the brethren, that there is no one to give encouragement, and should there be someone at this period who happens to offend him in some way or another, this too the demon uses to contribute further to his hatred. So I just can't stand my work, I can't stand my co-workers, I can't stand this place, i got to get out of here. Anyone ever experienced this demon? Ever? You thought it was a first world problem. That's not, it's an ancient problem. The demon drives him along to desire other sites where he can more easily procure life's necessities, more readily find work, and make a real success of himself. He goes on to suggest that, after all, it's not the place that is the basis of pleasing the Lord. God is to be adored everywhere. He joins to these with the reflections, the memory of his dear ones, and of his former way of life. Oh, when I was young and free. He depicts life stretching out for a long period of time and brings before the mind's eye the toil of ascetic struggle. And just as the saying has it, he leaves no leaf unturned to induce the monk to forsake his cell and drop out of the fight. No other demon follows close upon the heels of this one, but a state of deep peace uh, when he is defeated, but a state of deep peace and inexpressible joy arise out of the struggle. So you have to struggle against this demon. You can't just give in to it, right? But that's the problem. The demon says, give it up. Just stop fighting. How do you fight against that? Holden says, in Acadia and despondency, it's not just that things seem hopeless, they seem pointless. There's no use, it doesn't matter, it doesn't make a difference, it's not worth it. A despondent person says with contempt, to hell with it. I don't give a darn how it turns out. It's a disorder of our insensitive part of our soul, the part of our will. And the fight goes out of us. We lose our good passion, and we struggle with the negative passion. We're not committed. You know this. You know how all this works. So how do you overcome this? Evagory says, when we, when we meet with the demon of Acadia, we are to sow seeds of a firm hope within us. And we sing with the holy David, why are you filled with sadness, my soul? Why are you distraught? Trust in God, for I shall give praise to him. He it is who saves me, the light of my eyes and my God. Psalm 42. We have to stand firmly and be patient. We have to go through it. We have to feel it, experience it, accept it as the blahs that it is, but push through. We have to face it face to face. To flee and to shun such conflicts schools the spirit in awkwardness, cowardice, and fear, says Evagrius. So, Macarius the Great, he says, stated that the monk should always live as if he were to die the next day. But at the same time, he should treat his body as, he, as if he will live for many years to come. For he said, by the first attitude, he will cut off every thought that comes from Acadia and become more fervent. And by the second, he will preserve his body in good health and maintain its continence intact. So can you do both those things? Live as if today is your last day, the last day of many, many days. To live fully and intentionally every moment. Holden says, this is more easier said than done, right? If we're not in the grips of despondency, it's 
Yeah, sure, it's easy, makes sense. Just stand firm. But if you're in the clutches of this, if you feel like you are suddenly in an abyss, a bottomless deep, and you cannot see the way out, it can be very difficult. We become stuck in a moment. Is there nothing more that we can do when we're there? Holden points out to the image uh, that happens in the book of Numbers. You might remember that the people of God began to despair because they were afflicted uh, by a plague of snakes. And Moses prayed to God and asked them for deliverance from the snakes. And God gave a very strange commandment. He said, you shall make this bronze serpent and you shall put it up on a pole. And when the people will look on it, they will be healed. So Moses made this uh, bronze snake, put it up on a pole, and when the people looked at it, they were healed. What the heck is going on there? Sounds like some weird magic. And when John wrote his gospel, he also mentioned the same imagery when he talked about who Jesus was. Just as Moses, in fact, Christ himself said, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life, for God so loved the world as to give his only begotten Son, that everyone who believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus is our bronze serpent. And when we are in the pit of despair, we are unable to do anything else, the one thing we can do is look up. That's what makes us human, by the way. That's what the word anthropos means. The animal that looks up. We look up to our bronze serpent, to our Christ on the cross. Holden says, so far as I have ever found, and he's a professional here, there is one and only one way to get through the wilderness of despondency. One of the ancient fathers, St. Gregory of Nyssa, in a commentary on the story of the people in the wilderness, wrote this about this. There is one antidote for these evil passions, the purification of our souls, which takes place through the mystery of godliness. The chief act of faith is the mystery, in the mystery, is to look to him who suffered the passion for us. The cross is the passion, so that whoever looks to it is not harmed. The person who looks to the one lifted up on the wood of the cross rejects passion, diluting the poison with the fear of the commandment is with the medicine. The voice of the Lord teaches this. The Son of Man must be lifted up as Moses lifted up the serpent. How do we look upon the one lifted up on the wood? By remembering the meaning of what he suffered. Holden concludes, and I'll conclude with his words. The suffering and death of Christ our Lord were not simply historical events, things that happened 2,000 years ago. The suffering and death of Christ were a revelation of what has been happening in the depths of the being of God since he created the world. According to the book of Revelation, the Lamb of God has been slain from the foundation of the world. Revelation 13, 8. The suffering and death of Christ reveal what is happening now deep in the heart of God, what God himself suffers until the end of the age. To put it another way, when we look to Christ, when we imagine him on the cross, we must see, learn to see that he is still suffering, that he is experiencing right now all that we are experiencing, all the pain, all the fear, all the rejection, all the depths of the inner hell. He knows better than we do how we feel, how we hurt, why we cry, Every tear that we ever shed fell from God's eye. That's the kind of God we have. That's our really loving God. Brothers and sisters, may God grant you bountiful hope in the power of the Holy Spirit through the prayers of Simeon and Anna, the Canaanite woman, and of all the saints. Amen. Christ is among us. Yeah. Yeah.